Have you ever been knocked down and found it hard to get up? Have you ever been knocked down and bounced back to come back even stronger? Hi, I'm Gaurav Bhagat and you can call me GB and welcome to the Smash Bashed Yet Not Dashed podcast. A fortnightly podcast where I speak about persistence, perseverance and overcoming the odds to come out ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Smashed Bashed Yet Not Dashed podcast, a podcast where we talk about inspirational tales of perseverance and seeing the day through despite the odds. Today, I have a very special guest amongst us, and this is one podcast episode I've really been looking forward to, not only because it is with someone who's inspired me immensely over the last nine years, but also someone that has constantly challenged many many others to go above and truly shine. It is my honor to welcome Rakesh Kocher, Executive Director of BNI Gurgaon and Regional Director of BNI Faridabad on the Smashed Bashed Get Not Dashed podcast. Welcome, Rakesh. Thank you, Gaurav. An absolute privilege to be here with you. I've had the pleasure of knowing you over the past eight to nine years and uh, um, your life journey has been absolutely remarkable too. And I don't think you say, share it enough I think there's so much to learn and get inspired by what you have done. Thank you, Rakesh. I appreciate that so very much. So, Rakesh, I believe that along with Arti, you know, you run what is to my mind one of the jewels in the crown of the BNI world. But let's start with how does Rakesh Kocher introduce himself to someone that's never met him before? I call. I, I think it's a great question. Uh, it depends on the audience, actually. So if it's a pretty woman, I usually uh, introduce myself differently. If it's an entrepreneur, I introduce myself differently. If it's a young lad, differently. So it depends on the audience. So who, who do you think I should be talking to and introducing myself right now? Yeah, let's let's get you to pick. Uh, you know, you choose the one. Perhaps the young lad, because I think that's that's an audience. The young lad or the entrepreneur, because that really is an audience that listens into this podcast. So perhaps we can take it from their perspective. So as a young entrepreneur, my first question would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is Rakesh and it's an absolute delight to meet you. Tell me a little more about yourself. I would mm -hmm. engage him or her to understand uh, what's that person's story and uh, what's driving that person and then introduce myself. Love uh, that. That's what I would do. Right. So almost like be interested to be interesting. I like that. Um, awesome. Lovely. Yeah. But let's let's also tell our listeners a little bit more about, uh, you know, who you are. And perhaps I'll take you back to your childhood when um, I'm, I'm sure fond memories of growing up in a small town, small town in comparison to the larger cities of the, uh, you know, the, the metros, etc. Jamshedpur. So anything that you'd like to share about, you know, growing up at that time and how it shaped you to who you became in due course? Absolutely, Gaurav. I think a lot of us uh, get shaped by our early influences. And, and if you really look back, um, we are actually uh, telescoping on that initial foundation of ex uh, experiences. Sure. And for me, my school and my city has been that foundation of my experience. So I grew up in the 60s. I have no problem sharing that with you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it was a rock and roll time. Seriously, when I say rock and roll, it is rock and roll time. Yep. Yep. Um, but what I got inspired by was a very uh, a capitalism which was unheard of at that point of time. If you think about the Tatas and Jamshedji Tata, yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. first steel plant, he's putting that up in the 19th, early 19th century. And he's already right. talking, if you read his memoirs, he's talking about make sure there are really wide roads. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of greenery and there is space reserved in the city for every religion. So there should be a space reserved for a mosque. For, for a church and for it. You're talking this early 19th century and how relevant is that today? And mm -hmm. it, it, it was being funneled through the uh, benevolence of uh, what he was trying to do, construct the first uh, steel plant, which right. was not easy anyway to do it in the middle of Chota Nagpur. Right. Uh, you had to go in there through elephants, but that's another story I would love to share with you mm -hmm. at some time. Mm -hmm. And the second part was my schooling. So I studied in Loyola High School and um, this uh, beautiful institution, you know, at that point of time was uh, founded and run by the Jesuits of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they actually brought in, and it was a mix of Irish fathers and American fathers. It was a boys' school. Now it's an uh, 
uh, co-ed education and uh, that that has been a very powerful influence in my mind all the time yeah so yes back to you yeah thank you for sharing and of course uh, a visionary indeed uh, you know that set up jamshedpur and my first visit to jamshedpur was many many years ago i need to go back again and yes uh, definitely definitely pay a visit and thank you for setting that in context so you finished of course with school you found your way to the prestigious uh, zavias college in calcutta and also of course did xlri in jamshedpur and i i hear you speak about your time in xlri jamshedpur and how it was perhaps a time that led to some of the out of the box thinking you know that you're really uh, you know well known for and you know always reached out to for so perhaps uh, maybe uh, we can uh, know a little bit about uh, you know zavias and xlri as well so zavias during a time uh, was a very interesting place to be in and we used to have a very early morning class so i was doing a bcom honors program mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and would start at 7 in the morning and we would be pretty much done by about 10 10 10:30 right and uh, so i i'm coming from jamshedpur a small town going to calcutta big town mm-hmm. and uh, park street that time was a very lively street unlike what you see today mm-hmm. you had louis banks pam crane Mm-hmm. uh cruising away in the evenings uh, I, I, if you're familiar with calcutta you yeah. a lot of nostalgic memories are going down there right. but saint david saint david's and fluries were kind of uh, uh, so it was a triangle right you yeah. had loreto on one end you had fluries on one end and saint david's in the middle right and and but the part which i remember most about that place was again uh father joris again a belgian some some say he was a national football player at that mm-hmm. point of time extremely wow. strict uh, made sure you know he stands at the gate uh, you are you are in college you are experiencing this heady freedom and you don't like anybody telling you anything but <laughs> this, this uh, man had his own way of uh, getting his message across and right. that has always stayed me that you don't have to compromise but you don't have to say it in a way which hurts uh, people they, they, a young person a young man he could, he could be extremely strict with you but go in the afternoon play football with you and right. that is a lesson i will never forget yeah 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 i love that and of course uh, calcutta of the 60s and 70s is is legendary i hear my dad speak about that often because of course my dad grew up uh, in calcutta as well and i was born in calcutta by the way oh, yeah. so i do go back to uh, park street uh, you know often even now we still have a lot of family there but yes of course uh, you know you can't uh compare the calcutta of today with what it was in the 60s 70s um for yes. sure i guess and yeah, i thought by the you. time i will grow up and enter those kind of restaurants because in college i didn't have much money the right. only time i could enter those restaurants was my parents would come in from jamshedpur and take me in yeah but the world had changed by the time i graduated awesome let's like move forward now after college you start your corporate journey um i believe it was in PV, in pwc uh and then you move to dubai and you're with um, ey you're also now a chartered accountant uh eventually you find your way to oracle as a senior director so let's about let's hear about you know your learnings and experiences at these organizations and what it meant to a little boy as you mentioned yourself growing up in small town india and then having exposure to some of these global organizations across you know global cities what was that really like so uh, you know uh, now we are talking about 85 so just put a uh, yeah, time frame context there right, right. Um, right. so i've done my mba i've done, passed my ca and at that point of time this was not a very uh, popular combination so mm-hmm. uh, so I, i i literally was getting job offers i could pick and choose but at that point right. of time let me also share uh, it was a time for uh, uh salary controls for example the managing director of tata steel used to get 5000 rupees at the point of time mm-hmm. it's another thing he had a aeroplane to go all, all around for his private charters but <laughs> he, had, he was paid right. literally 5000 rupees yeah and you could not travel as easily as we can travel today so right. and and my mba had exposed me to new ideas uh, you know whether it's in terms of marketing and one thing i learned from xlri which i have mm-hmm. not shared enough is mm-hmm. the importance of communication in anything right. you do that was my number one thing i learned and don't right. ever shy away from that um i i know it's a fear it's the number one audience i i know somebody as you i i've seen your metaphors from uh trying to uh, you know stay in the shadows to finding the light and shine on me that kind of a change um right. it, it's not easy people people you know uh, make uh, very derisive comments about people who who can stand up and communicate 
a, a right. value. Pro- but it's not about your your real communication is never about yourself. Your real communication is uh, what can I help you with, and that's what I learned in Excel. Right? I love that. Yeah, and such a valuable uh, lesson. Whether it's and, in terms right. of your marketing pitch, your sales, pitch, and and uh, that that is something which stood me uh, for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And um, so so yeah, so I, I'm this young man. Uh, Price Water House. They just started this management consultancy uh, division, and uh, gave me a chance to wear a suit. I had never worn a suit till then. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so you know, silly things make you take this and uh, offer for months and young in Dubai global office as part of the Middle East operations. Right. That's like heck. Uh, this sounds good. Catch the plane and away I went. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then of course uh, there was um, the uh, standard Oracle as well, which was. Uh, Again, had you in a very very senior position in Dubai? So post. Oracle was a, yeah, uh, Oracle was a very interesting stint. Um, at that point in time, um, Oracle had not moved their shared services center to to Bangalore as you see it today. Uh, mm-hmm. a part of their programming uh, 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 operations had come there. Today, you have more than uh, sixteen thousand people from Oracle uh, based in. It's the second largest after US. So you have right. more than sixteen thousand people in Bangalore, Delhi. Hyderabad, but at that point, we were on the cusp of, of taking off, right? Mm-hmm. And um, when I joined, I was bringing in a shared service center uh, experience from another company called eFunds, right? And uh, they, I was tasked with how fast can you implement, uh, you know, collapsing seven uh, shared service centers across the world into Bangalore, and we want to do our financial accounts sort of here actually, um, and um, people weren't very happy with what we were trying to do. We were being set up at one point of time. Right. And I had to make a presentation to the global uh, CFO, which was another experience altogether. Mm-hmm. And um, had the chance of uh, meeting Larry Allison and uh, talking okay. to him. So awesome. these were amazing times. But the most amazing thing was the depth of India, which I realized at that point in time. We we were talking. Right. We were going to take over um, foreign language uh, uh, back office operations from sixteen different foreign languages. And what, whether it was Japanese right. or Spanish or Chinese or whatever wow. European language is French, you could think of. And right. believe you me, I always used, I used to basically come to Delhi or anywhere where I heard there, there are these mm-hmm. amazing <laughs> for mm-hmm. J, JNU was a great hunting ground. We literally yeah. would take busloads of people from JNU to all the way to Bangalore. Right. And HP had started this, uh, gave us the confidence actually. They were the first to do it. And uh-huh. we saw it. We went and studied the HP model and said, if they could do it, we can do it. And we did it on a b- much bigger scale. So we ramped up from an operation of about 80 people in the GFIC at that point of time to 3,000 people in one and a half years. And we did our first closing also. So, wow. so w- what it did was taught me a lot about Picking up very, very impossible goals, but uh, yeah. having a team to back you up with it. Uh, we, we used to track it down. Literally, we used to have per charts. We used to track it down to the small steps mm-hmm. and uh, figure out what, what is the critical path through this. And the, the, the critical path we would never compromise on, no matter what, and everything else would. So it taught me a lot, which right. uh, later on became very uh, important for me to uh, share with uh, the other uh, others when I got an opportunity. Awesome and truly a pioneering spirit in the sense that you were amongst uh, the first uh, you know in the country that was probably doing this. So I'm sure that would have been you know really great learnings as well. So in the midst of all this, where did where did you actually meet uh, Arti, who is of course you know your wife and again another inspirational leader? Because a where did you meet her and b you yeah, both you have an, an amazing equation like between you know the both of you so yeah would love to know about how you guys met, how you met and eventually you know uh, became husband and wife so, so i was doing so my first you know how the indian families work you need approval uh, of the elders and then you're allowed to meet so i was doing yeah. a post i had actually come to delhi and i was doing my article ship here and uh, went with my um, senior to uh, mr raghu raj's house Right. Uh, he, he was the chairman Air India at that point of time. Mm-hmm. And to do his uh, income tax returns of all things. Okay. And that's when he saw me kind of must have liked something about what I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I got him a refund. I'm not too, uh, not too clear at this point <laughs> in time. <laughs> right. But uh, then he spoke to uh, and said, you know, find out more about this guy. And that led one thing to the other. So the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the really funny thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was given an invite by Aarti to come over to Assam. That's where mm-hmm. she's from, the, uh, the gardens of Assam. Right, right. 
and uh, those days there were two flights uh, if i remember correctly uh, from calcutta to assam and i uh, i said you know i'll get late in the evening i took the earlier flight and i rang them up and said you know i'm trying to get the earlier flight could you please right. with the right. pickup mm-hmm. so anyway there was a bundle of confusion and i realized there's nobody there to receive me and i'm being an arrogant young man Mm. uh you know so i said heck man i mean i'm not given respect i actually went and bought the uh, uh, you know a ticket to go back oh. and um, suddenly i got a call on my mobile phone we mm-hmm. used to carry those big mobile mm-hmm. phones mm-hmm. and saying the driver was frantically hunting for me and he was telling me i'm waiting for you for the last 3 hours and you're not around and i was really upset with the whole thing mm-hmm. and so right. when i entered the house i had a little you know mm-hmm. fluff of dust flying right. all over <laughs> right 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 and and there it the story never ended after mm. that oh awesome super so i'm going to now take you to you know perhaps uh, one of you know your uh, first uh, smash bash uh, moments uh, you working for oracle and i think it was on a trip to the us we started feeling quite unwell and i would like to talk a little bit about you know what happened on that trip and the weeks and months uh, that really followed because i know that was one time which was really really traumatic for you Yes, and of all the uh, places I really felt sick was in Lake Tahoe. It was my uh, so I was there for this uh, big uh, convention, Oracle convention, uh, you know, where the Oracle board was meeting, and we were all the senior people across the world had been called over. First time yes. I had flown business class also, and uh, I thought this is the life, right? Uh, but um, didn't know what's around the corner. So yeah, I felt sick there. Uh, it, I. I still remember it. it I've been I'm looking out of the uh, uh, hotel and this beautiful snowfall, and I'm sitting there and I'm just not able to enjoy it because I'm retching away, I'm vomiting away, and it didn't stop for the next three days. Mm-hmm. And I was rushed to the local uh, doctors. They ran a bunch of tests. They said most probably you've eaten shellfish, which I had eaten mm-hmm. previous day. I had eaten some oysters. Mm-hmm. I was on my expense account, so why should I? I mean, mm-hmm. I was eating like oysters. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. so he said you know he said most probably is that uh, you know i'm don't eat the medicines i'm prescribing them to you don't buy them go back to your hotel wait for my call and he ran these right. uh, you know lab reports on me and he said just wait for that mm-hmm. so 3 mm-hmm. hours later mm-hmm. i get this call he says i'm sending the ambulance to you you need to come back i said sorry uh, you just said it was uh, you know upset stomach upset right. or uh, food poisoning what do you mean sending the ambulance Well, he said, "I can't discuss it on the phone. You need to come into, or I'll be, uh, you know, you just have to. It's uh, very important to do that." And then the whole thing changed. My, my I, I was. Uh, um, this was October. To put again things in a timeline, October two thousand four, right? And uh, things kind of rapidly fell away. Uh, I was di- uh, diagnosed within a month after that uh, with um, um, kidney failure. end stage renal disease and uh, by january uh, i was being prepared for a transplant but things weren't working out to me and i i, I also believe in coincidences by the way uh, mm-hmm. if you want we can get into that uh, mm-hmm. but uh, by january uh, a team of doctors who had come to certify manipal on their um, uh, quality practices they had a multiple myeloma uh, specialist in that team and uh, my file was presented to them as the ideal file of how documents are kept and i was you know a garrulous uh, uh, uh patient nice guy to meet he talks about so i was the uh, the kind of ideal uh, patient uh, presented to them mm-hmm. and when he saw my file he says you been uh, wrongly diagnosed i think all my experience tells me you have multiple myeloma and that led to another series of tests and uh, i was diagnosed with multiple myeloma also uh, yeah. at uh, so i was diagnosed as stage 3b and then it um uh, yeah i i could tell you after that it was 6 years of fighting this disease yeah. and um, i was very lucky uh, to come out of this it took me so i went for a, a renal transplant i went for a bone marrow transplant I uh, had some amazing doctors across the ocean. I was treated in U.S. in um, University of Arkansas, uh, one of the uh, foremost areas for multiple myeloma. I was treated uh, for uh, 
uh, kidney transplant here in uh, uh, Gurgaon. My father was a donor, is a donor for me. And uh, yeah, so he gave me life the second time around. I mean, I was very lucky as to have a parent like him. And, uh, um, but it was an, a journey which had uh, despair. Right? It was a journey which had um, very, very difficult moments, but it eventually ended in hope. And I'll tell you one thing, uh, the, the one reason, actually the three reasons there which helped me out of this. One was the support I got from people I didn't know. Two right. was the support, and I'm telling you seriously, people I didn't know. If they weren't there, mm-hmm. I would not have been the head. I, I, I used to drink bottles of blood to get my hemoglobin up on a daily basis because of the dialysis. Damn. And there would always, every day, be somebody there to denote, uh, donate plasma. or. And right. this was being done by my school alumni. I didn't know anything about uh, this. I was, I was not in a position to deal with it. Um, right. um, and then my family was uh, backed me up totally. Got, it's extremely expensive to get yourself treated without uh, insurance in the US, especially right. on cutting edge protocol. The whole protocol was designed towards me. Uh, right. uh, now we are talking about uh, 2000, uh, 2008, 2008, mm-hmm. yeah. No, no, 2007. So uh, very custom. And Dr. Barlogi, he, he, he was an amazing, uh, uh, he's a pioneer in this area on multiple myeloma. Right. And the third uh, thing which worked for me was, uh, you, you know, when I was being treated in the US, the number one thing I realized that nobody treats you as a sick person. And that was my mind shift. From mm-hmm. India, everybody would come to me and say, poor guy. And I stopped yeah. meeting people because they would say, poor guy. Yeah, I yeah. just would not want to hear that. Right, right. I I, I was not a poor guy. Yeah. Till I went there. Yeah. And I saw these people. We had other multiple myeloma support. People volunteering in that city, Little Rock, uh, to help people. Uh, just go to the supermarket, take you for a coffee. Citizens of that yes. place. I mean, I, I mean, what we see today as citizens, the most... Um, uh, should I say the humble citizens are out there helping each other? Same way, the most humble citizens were helping each other. Just and like, I'll yeah. never forget that lesson. And and but the last thing was, um, you know, uh, there were a lot of despairs at time because your body was wrecked. Uh, it, it's a horrible experience. There was a time when I had a tube through every orifice, and I'm not kidding. Mm. Uh, uh, so you you don't feel good about yourself. Your sense of self worth goes down. Yeah. Um, but uh, that time, Aarti told me one thing, and I uh, won't forget that. Hey, you, 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 whatever you want to do is your choice. And mm-hmm. she would never talk, uh, mm-hmm. you know, my husband kind of thing. She would be like, okay, man, you're the commando. You're the seal. Get, get going. Get going. Right. Right. Till right. one day, I, she uh, reminded me. I told her that, you know what? I'm going to be all right. I want to see my son's uh, graduation. My son was in the U.S. at that point of thing. Right, I, right. And I said, I'm going to see his graduation. I'm going to see also my younger son's uh, mm. grandchildren. Mm. Waiting for both. Both yeah. graduation has happened now. <laughs> it's happened, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So eventually you got to take control. People can help you, but you have to take your own control. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for sharing. And I can only, I mean, you know, just imagine how rough this would have been. And so... The Rakesh culture before 2007 and, and of course, you know, the Rakesh of uh, post-2013, uh, naturally your, your thoughts have been, you know, altered your, your, your perspective, your why, your life purpose, you know, I'm sure everything has just tweaked or changed, you know, pretty drastically after that. Do you want to talk us about that in terms of what was important, you know, prior and, and post? Uh, unfortunately, we have to go through these, um, uh, really, um, some kind of um, incident in our lives mm-hmm. where it forces you to think and assess mm-hmm. what's what is important. Uh, even like today, it's forcing us to assess what's important to each one of us, right? Okay. And uh, we suddenly realize, you know, uh, our priorities can be different, and our lifestyles maybe should change to meet those priorities. Right. And a whole bunch of questions around that. And and I was I, I was given the same choice uh, mm-hmm. in. Uh, you know, in 2007, and, but, uh, and then it, you know, it took me three, four years after that to even get back to where I am today in mm-hmm. terms of uh, mm-hmm. being able to converse with you and go back to an act. So the n- few things I learned, number one is 
don't ever compromise with your health. Okay, everything in else. Oh, you know, I was this busy executive living a 24 by 7 lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, you know, before uh, I would wake with uh, Australia and Japan and not sleep till America would sleep. And I had everything possible. Nobody would ask me anything. You, you, right. I could do anything I like. Right. But at the end of the day, I felt sick. So, so basically, I was just sharing what really matters to me, right? That's the question right. which I started asking myself more and more. Yeah. And yeah. the realization for me was what really matters to me is relationships. Uh, what yeah. matters to me is control of my time. What mm -hmm. matters to me is health. And what matters to me is family and relationships. And everything else will flow from here. Yeah. So, and, and one other thing which, <laughs> which I learned was don't waste your time trying to be polite with somebody who's, who, who's doing nothing but uh, distracting you from your purpose. You should disengage and walk away from that situation. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing on that one. And valuable lessons, you know, take care of your health. And, and everyone's repeatedly saying this, even when I was in the US uh, last <clears throat> for the last growth conference uh, in uh, 2020, uh, just prior to the lockdowns i mean every speaker that came said get your sleep you know don't play that game where you're so busy and you know just so crazy doing stuff because when it comes back and hits you it's really going to come back and hit you so never take that for granted right. so thank you so much you know for sharing on that one as well and you know next i want to talk about another interesting uh fork in your life and it was of course you know, when we also first met so perhaps uh, you know mid 12 uh, 2012 uh, arti's in the us and you've come in as a substitute to bni gurgaon uh, our chapter excellence and i remember you'd always get buzzed in the 30 seconds you'd always overshoot and there would always be someone who'd be buzzing you so what were your first impressions of bni excellence uh, the chapter that arti and i were both a part of so we have this um thing in our family, especially with my two sons, they always, whenever they were in the US, they would keep calling me and say, uh, how's your breakfast club doing? Mm -hmm. So that kind of stuck, right? I used to keep hearing uh, this thing, mm -hmm. breakfast club. All right. So this breakfast club thing, uh, you know, the label kind of stuck in my mind. And mm -hmm. Aarti, that, those days, uh, Binai Gurgaon was just the first chapter had just about come up and she was in the process of launching uh, the second chapter, Excellence. And mm -hmm. um, so she would go uh, at about uh, 7, 7.30 and she would not come back till about 1 in the afternoon and then again get involved with calling people and mm -hmm. these calls would happen. And those days, there wasn't Zoom. There was, you know, you had to do these physical meetings. Yeah, yeah. And um, I used to always wonder what's happening. And, uh, you know, why does it take so much of your time to just mm -hmm. do a simple thing like this? Mm -hmm. And so the club thing got magnified because of that. And uh, so I, I'd never really appreciated uh, what was happening there. And um, mm -hmm. so I'd never had an opportunity to go there. I would, whenever she would invite me, I would say, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. And mm -hmm. till uh, she was going uh, to US uh, for my younger son's uh, admissions there. I'm going to leave him there basically. Right. And um, that's when she said, can you uh, be present for a couple of weeks, which mm -hmm. turned out to be a month. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I'll go there. And then she would always talk to me about how difficult it's, it is to explain all things she does. Uh, right. She was a, a consultant of, on OD at that point of time. Yeah. And I said, okay, I'm a reasonable person. I, I've seen bits of this professional world. I've been in the corporate world. I, I think I can get this message across way better than you have been right. doing it now. Right. <laughs> and, and I would prepare um, my 30 seconds mm -hmm. and uh, try and say it. But, but I, <laughs> that's where I learned how to do my 30 seconds, actually, because right. I never realized the challenge of trying to get your message ac across in a precise format. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which includes various elements. And, and uh, this is not the forum to tell you, but there are five elements in that and you've mm -hmm. got to bring them all together mm -hmm. in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. But And I would always feel that I was picked upon because I was Arti's husband, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember the initial reluctance, but I mean, of course, uh, you know, eventually uh, you totally grew into it and everyone loved having you over. And so that was that was great to see, of course. So let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, what you guys have built together. And this is BNI Gurgaon and Faridabad. And of course, you know, everyone looks at BNI Gurgaon and Faridabad as this amazing region with superstar members, trainers, an ecosystem of success. 
Um, despite being one of the smallest in terms of catchment area and population, what do you attribute these you know, successes to and what the region achieves? And how do you think that ties back with you know, your experiences uh, that you both have had um, in your lives? So uh, I, I think I would uh, attribute our success to the following things. One, even pretty early on, uh, we, had, we had a great uh, regional team. And what this team and us, when, whenever we would brainstorm, uh, we quickly realized if we figure out what we really stand for early on when we just had about 100, 110 members, uh, it'll be easy to communicate uh, to people uh, what we can do for you. Because at this point of time, we still did not have a proven uh, uh, piece to show to you. Uh, we were still doing, yeah. if you join us and we can do the following steps together, this is the big uh, goal we can achieve, right? So it's a, still a moonshot. We were talking the moonshot. But to do that, sure that. Uh, to do that, we had to take care of the why first. And that why came from our value statement. The value yeah. statement, which quickly actually crystallized to was, and that really resonated to me because it was, again, a part of my childhood memory. And my childhood memory was my father used to run a forging unit, right? And it was in Jamshedpur, Bihar at that point of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would see anybody and anybody who had a power, whether it was the bureaucracy or the local uh, uh, political scenario, they, right. at that point, things were not very good in, in the state, right? They right. would come in and ask for this or that and that. And mm -hmm. you were he was giving employment to 120 uh, uh, people out of which uh, 80 of them were the local, what we call the Adivasi labor. Right. Um, right. right. So, I mean, instead of being uh, celebrated for that, he, he was uh, easy pickings for anybody who would go by. So there was no respect on entrepreneurship. That kind of always used to haunt me. Mm -hmm. And I said, when BNI, when I really understood BNI, I said, this is a great platform to provide respect to the entrepreneurs. And, they, and even today, I, I can say this is, there is not enough respect given for the value creation which on, an entrepreneur does in the economy. A lot of lip service is paid for it, definitely, yeah. Yeah. but respect is not given. It's still easy pickings and something which rankles with me. So the number one thing which we said was we need to provide a space which is safe for entrepreneurs. They will feel proud of themselves. And, and the, num the thing was um, they should feel proud of what they're doing. Right. That right. was our underlying mission thing, a place which is right. safe and they're proud of what they're doing. And the second thing that we said, the only way this can happen is when you're dealing with the North and everybody is on a hair trigger, we mm -hmm. got to have, we got to have values, right? And these values will not change no yeah. matter who you are. Yeah. So we'll yeah. never look at your face. You can be the biggest business person or you can be a single person professional. The values will remain constant in our right. approach with each other. Right. right. And those values we quickly distilled by doing a poll about, with all the members at that point of time and the regional team. What yeah. do we really stand for? And then we turned it, distilled it into six to seven values. Right. And we kept right. talking about these same values. And we were not worried about numbers at first. But yeah. the, this value and this purpose of providing right. an identity of pride to the entrepreneur, that kind of helped us figure out what we need to do. And that led to amazing people like yourselves being part of the regional team. So, uh, you know, it attracts. The other thing you really need to do, we do, a lot of us say you need to attract people who are better than you in, in your organization. And, uh, but most people feel threatened by it. So one mm -hmm. of the things both RT and me realized uh, was um, if we don't attract them into our team, people who can challenge our thoughts, people who can give us alternatives, we, we are just going to be another me too in this world. Yeah. And uh, that, that provided us with, uh, with, with a sounding word that every time we do something new, um, uh, you know, they, we are intellectually challenged about that proposition. And that is different mm -hmm. than taking it and internalizing it as a personal challenge. Uh, a challenge on, on a theme or on an action is different than challenging me or you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Agreed. these small practices kind of brought in the differentiators in the region. Uh, I mean, I mean, um, it also it's also about consistency, right? It's right. about it's about being focused upon uh, on who you are serving rather than you are not serving me. I have to be very clear about this. No member here is serving me. Agreed. 
okay. right? No member. Mm. But uh, if uh, if at any point of time you let that uh, uh, understanding change, yeah, yeah, uh, our, our response to the situation will be very different. And these are the small things, nothing big, uh, which we everybody knows this, but uh, yeah. These are no, but amazing points that you mentioned, uh, you know, you set in place a culture, a culture which wasn't, you know, Aarti in your culture, it was a culture of the members or like by the members or from the members. And that's truly, you know, what was uh, driven down and said that, hey, this applies, you know, to all. And I think the culture and the values have really always attracted people and driven people, you know, towards us uh, as a region. Of course, the second thing that you stressed on a lot is in terms of team and the team's only grown and keeps getting, you know, better and better. And we look at the initial five that used to sit around on some of the leadership tables. And today we have, you know, rooms of 150, 200 people. So it's great to see you know, also where these leaders have gone, of course, you know, uh, they have been driven by a lot of the values that you mentioned. And of course, uh, the other thing I love that you said is that you don't have to be threatened by someone, you know, who's uh, better. In fact, it's it's only good that they bring another value set and that takes things to the next level. And truly, that's why we've seen, you know, BNI Gurgaon and Fridabad where it is today. And you're speaking now on global stages, you're at the conferences, everyone wants to know what Aarti and Rakesh do. Everyone wants to know what the regional team is all about. And it's amazing how, you know, despite all your successes, you continue to deflect it and say, hey, it's, it's my team and it's not us. So truly that is, you know, uh, uh, an awesome, uh, um, you know, practice that you practiced. So let's just go now to another smash bash moment. And this is March 2020. Everything's, you know, going great, going fine. The region is cruising. Uh, 24 chapters, 1200 members heading towards 2000, 2100. The goals are all in place. And then comes the first lockdown. And you have to move, you know, from running those, you know, large meetings at hotels across Gurgaon, online over Zoom, no experience, no warning, no software. And not even for a week did you cancel a meeting, right? So what was what was that like? But that truly had to be another really scary time. So it was scary. I still remember. I think Gaurav, you were part of that, that meeting. Uh, we had these huge mega ho hotel ballrooms booked for a 400 member training. Yeah. And uh, we were not even sure uh, what will be the financial consequences of doing that. But at that point of time, because of inputs of all the team was, you know what? It's not about the money, it's not, and we were going to do a full leadership change. So we got to train the new set of leaders. Right. So just imagine the flux at that point of time, the transition yeah. in the organization at that point of time. For that. Right. So it moves from being a financial question to a, a leadership question to transition. Uh, and then it moves to a higher plane, which is what don't our, don't our members deserve security and safety? Mm. I think when that question was put up by you guys in the team about security and safety, because at some point, even I was still pushing, maybe we can squeeze this in. There's this so last window left. So and uh, uh, all of you said no. <laughs> and I, I remember Arthi also called me frantically from the US because mm -hmm. my son uh, had fallen sick at that point of time. Right. In the US. right. And um, uh, she also said, you know, you guys don't even realize the kind of tsunami which is being sweeping in the, in the US. Uh, be you are still just a day or two ahead of the curve, but shut it down, and right. we shut it down. Yeah, and yep. and and once we sh took that decision, actually, I could see that whole burden lift from everybody's shoulders, and we were actually very happy that we took that decision. But in in the next breath, we were all straight away saying, "Now what?" When uh, you have a team which you know doesn't just figure out the next step, but you got to figure out. The next series of steps, uh, because it's it's a cascade. You know, no organization works on a discrete basis. You got to work it. it it's a continuum. So you got to figure the continuum. Every action, yep. where is the next action going? This action going to lead to the next action. Yep. What's the continuum yep. here? And everybody True. jumped on the continuum. So we said, mm -hmm. you know what? We got to train. Our meeting start on Tuesday, so we got Saturday. <laughs> we got Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, three days. Yep. We said, yep. all right. So we put teams in place. Um, uh, we had to communicate to everybody, to 12, 1,200 members, yeah. this is happening. So we had sure. another team to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had to put in, uh, for 35 years, we yeah. only met physically. And here is a mindset, a barrier. Yeah. How can you do what you have done for 35 years differently? And, sure that. and you're emotionally connected to the whole uh, shebang, right? Mm -hmm. Which parts mm -hmm. are you going to drop? Because mm -hmm. now you've got to drop. And remember one more thing. We had 45 minutes at that point of time or 30 minutes, I'm not too sure, of free Zoom. 
because right. we had four to right. five chapters running on a day so we didn't yeah. even have zoom licenses and we are transitioning so we can only use the free zoom yeah. so we had to cut down the script to what 30 to 45 minutes oh, and yeah. make it happen so sure, that so and everybody loved every bit of the steps so it was very mm-hmm. hard to you know carve it up into yeah. a, a two and a half hour script to a 30 minute script but right. everybody did their part and uh, we already did training and we did trainings on Sunday and Monday. Mm-hmm. Tuesday, we had the thing going. For two weeks, This um, uh, the, uh, the incumbent team ran it. And within two weeks, we were changing over to the next uh, team. And again, and this is this is where I say decisive leadership is important. You got to take some risk in life, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Everybody said, and most uh, places around said, you know what, we'll stay with the team. We can't invest in doing this uh, changeover at this point of time. We, they've just got used to it. And now you want another fresh set of people to come in. Yeah. And I still remember that discussion. But the one thing, again, the question was not about difficulty. When the question was repurposed and reframed, what do you think those leaders who have been told up till now that they have the chance to influence sure that. 1,200 entrepreneurs, yeah. what happens? What, what, what is the message we are giving them? We are not, we, we don't trust you with your leadership skills. And when it was reframed in that uh, term, mm-hmm. and that's what I love my team for. Yeah. You guys reframed it and you said this. And, and, and that is what most organizations need to do to be successful. You need to reframe the challenge in a context which mm-hmm. drives it to your value. And we said, no, we will change it no matter. Training difficulties, all small things when you mm-hmm. compare it to that question. True that. Yeah, I love that. And uh, truly, uh, you know, very decisive decisions, of course, were made at that time, even when it would have been easier to say, you know what, let's just let's just call it off for a couple of weeks until we've you know, got our head around this and the software is in place. And I think uh, hats off that, you know, not for a day did we even think about cancelling the meeting, maybe for a few minutes, we thought about it, but then the show must go on. And it truly has uh, today, 15 months uh, you know, later, and we uh, continue to, you know, persevere on. So being a good government Fridabad, you know, fantastic regions, but also made up of businesses who have, uh, which are, you know, run by solopreneurs. And then on the flip side, you've got some companies which have hundreds of crores of turnover, hundreds of employees. How have you kept them focused and on this path to keeping the faith? I mean, of course, the first lockdown was bad enough, but now we have um, the second. So how have you kind of kept them focused and, you know, continue to get them to see the light at the end of the tunnel? So I would like to contrast both the lockdowns. They're not the same. Anybody tells right. you both the lockdowns are the same, they're not the same. The first, mm-hmm. just like it was a novel virus, the first lockdown was a novel lockdown. Uh, people weren't, weren't sure what is going to happen. Nobody, From the administrators to the population, to the healthcare givers, to whoever, we were not sure. And it never came home, right? It was something happening somewhere else. We never saw it. We never heard it. Okay. Sure, there was a lot of problems in terms of migration there was a lot of problems in terms of businesses closing uh sectors getting very badly affected yeah. uh, all of that was there but still it was a story far away outside my house it was not a story inside my house True that. the second lockdown changed everything it, it, the, uh, the the whole story now has entered everybody's house i i would be uh, surprised to hear if somebody's house is not entered and that was a mind shift. And uh, again, it has led to its own series of problems, right? So, so, so initially, uh, it, it, uh, the, the thing, the, the communication needed to be different for both the situation. And you had to understand that uh, pretty, pretty, pretty rapidly. Right. Uh, so here, when your own loved ones are getting affected, like people in your family, uh, the mood had turned, turned, turned very dire. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the liquidity liquidity issues were there. Uh, mm-hmm. Sector specific problems were there. Yeah. Um, some That's some sectors had orders but could, did not have labors to execute it. Uh, though this time there was no, uh, there was allowed to work. Factories were allowed to work. There was e pass was made easier. But still, the major problems, the you know, which was you've been constrained against, still ex- right. still rose. Right. Right. Right? right, and you had to deal with that. So, so we've been having, in fact, lucky, luckily, uh, for the last three weeks, we've been having a discussion on this very thing with the entrepreneurs of BNI Gurgaon, mm-hmm. and it was called "Let's Talk Business." 
on one of them you were a panelist too and uh, in this let's talk business we re- we quickly realize um in spite of everything which is happening in the entrepreneur's life his business is as important as anything else 100%. and the choice somehow it was uh, it was seeming at one point of time that it was yeah, you know right now you can't talk business but you can only talk um, what's happening in my family and you will be seen as uncaring if you don't talk only that right so that focus had to shift and the focus was had to shift not at the expense of being caring not right. at the expense of your relationships not right. at the expense of your charity work not at the expense of anything you were doing but this was also one more element in that conversational pool sure and that. and you had to prioritize that and you could prioritize that at your time right you could do it at maybe 6 to 8 in the morning and then go back to your family and spend right. some time in another 4 5 hours with your family or right. with the community work you were doing maybe mm-hmm. come back to it later mm-hmm. and hence you had to develop different ways of looking at your business and you had that opportunity and many people shared with us that they had dropped the initiatives they had started last time right thinking now you know by september october this was done and the boom had started the pent up demand had gone up so sure and is. you know when things are good you don't want to deal with mm. hard stuff right. but again it came back and and the uh, thing was and the number one thing we all discussed was is this disruption going to have a legacy in terms of is going to come back what's the frequency of this disruption right uh, what form will it come back will it always be a covid maybe not maybe yeah. disruption will come back in terms of technology product substitution consumer behavior 100%. so many millions of things that can come back right and yeah. we we need to be we need to be and and the and the cycle for decision making has got compressed yeah. so yes. what what would affect us earlier maybe in 2 3 4 years now it's affecting us in 3 months 4 months so that compressed cycle plus the changed environment has has played havoc in our traditional mindset of you know uh, thinking linearly so no more linear thinking you got to think in a different form yeah. and you got to do multiple things to be able to uh, tackle the situation and right. and and this came up as a self realization to most entrepreneurs that mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. about um, i i i it, you know i need to be also focused on my business to get in a, because i am a stakeholder for my employees also i'm a stakeholder for my vendors also i'm a stakeholder because i provide a valuable service to my customers also 100% now his chain also gets disrupted if i if i decide hey, you know what i'm not going to spin this wheel anymore no. if in this complex mechanism which is all interdependent yeah. my wheel yeah. doesn't spin somebody else's wheel gets stopped 100% 100% so i also have a responsibility i can't just stop spinning my wheel without giving him enough information that you better get an alternative in place Sure that, that. because that's what i i also deserve from the guy who's spinning the wheel for me also so we are in this interdependent mesh we got to think differently and it's not about you versus me we are all in it together and it, that's what this this uh, um, crisis has taught us is don't depend on others to help you really yeah we yeah. got to help ourselves and if yeah. you notice the maximum voluntary help and people who have come out are regular people who are not even as privileged as i am who have come out to help people with yeah. lesser they have heard stories of people selling their positions to help right. others how right. i mean that is what we uh, i mean if you can't salute that and we don't get inspired by that yeah. you don't need uh, heroes and uh, sheroes and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know these mega uh, yeah. stage uh, presence to tell you things are the simple things right. smash dash and not dash listen to it Yeah, 100%. So we come going to come to our concluding few questions uh, now maybe the last uh, three or four questions. So <clears throat> what a month ago and in fact I think it was the 19th of April we get a message that you've tested positive for covid-19 and everyone's heart sank uh, for two reasons uh, you know a of course uh, we knew how bad things already were in the NCR at that time and the second piece was you know your health issues and your past history um as a person what were you thinking at this time i mean i know we were all freaked out and we were like oh my god and you know sending prayers and wishes but what were you thinking at this time so the first day i really got freaked out let me tell you because uh, i i at that point i was not vaccinated neither am i vaccinated now mm-hmm. uh, because of the various reasons i was told hang on with your vaccination mm-hmm. and um, so i picked up this covid and i said okay it looks like bye bye <laughs> literally that's what i was thinking 
uh, because there were horrible stories going around at that point of time. But uh, I, I actually escaped the uh, dire uh, consequences of the whole thing. I was, uh, I came back pretty strongly. Um, so I was, though, uh, you know, first time I, I was telling Arti, you know, um, I realized uh, how much we, are, we, we take things for granted. For example, your own house, you, you know, the freedom of movement is so important to our well-being. Right. And when you get cooped up in a room, yeah. Luckily, I had a balcony, so I could always stare into the open space. I mean, just imagine a room which does not even have a balcony. Oh. Um, what, what does that do to your psychological well-being? So psychological well-being was very important. And right. I got a lot of support from a lot of people. I just uh, sucked that support up, right? I needed it. So I was very selfish. I just sucked it up. Mm. <laughs> and uh, uh, that really helped me. And my second thing what really helped me is even in my confinement, I would try and do a little bit of um, 10, 15 minutes of uh, some exercises, right? Whether right. I like uh, pace around or I just sit and do a little bit of yoga, right. though I'm not very good at it. But whatever I could do, whatever was my understanding of things, I did it. 15 minutes, did it. Mm -hmm. um, I quickly realized I, I'm not going to do all the... I went for a doctor's advice. I was not saying, hey, what was your prescription and give me the same medicines. Right. I didn't right. do that. Right. And right. even what the doctor told me to eat fully, I ate for a few days and said, forget it. But uh, that was my call. I don't recommend that yeah. to everybody. Yeah. Uh, but the important thing is the support. I would go back again to that emotional support. Yeah. Um, I felt very good when somebody from my uh, apartment complex rang me up and said, you know what? Uh, I'm your single point of contact. Uh, if you need anything, let, let us know. Awesome. Not that I needed anything, but right. the very fact right. that person called me made me feel so yeah. good because there are a lot of unknowns, right? Uh, I realized how much, uh, how important the garbage, uh, uh, you know, picker is because I would have garbage stored in yellow bags in my room for three, yeah. three days. Yeah. And yeah. just imagine, we don't even think of these kind of things. And I, uh, uh, I just realized how how interdependent we are on each other. And for me, uh, that that kind of got magnified and I realized uh, we should be more grateful. Uh, we should reach out to the others. Relationships. Again, I go back to relationships. Sure Never forget the story. And BNI is all about relationships and our members are amazing. Uh, right. At this point of time, we have over 150 members who have dedicated themselves as COVID warriors. Yeah. Helping anybody who's coming into a request to be in a Gurgaon to help them. We don't see who they are, who they belong to, why are they talking to us? Are you a member, not a member? Alex. And when you have people like this around, you can't but feel positive about everything in life. So that's what charged me up. And I said, I'm, I'm back. Mm. Yeah, and speaking about being back, I think it was uh, perhaps on the 29th of April. And uh, the only way we knew you were feeling better is because a nine minute, 30 second video comes to the regional team. And on that video, you spoke about your ordeal. And, uh, you know, since then we're seeing even, I mean, even a more driven version of you, right? So you want to talk our listeners and viewers through what has changed even more now, as you now head into another chapter of your life. A deeper appreciation, definitely a deeper appreciation. You know, mind is a very fickle thing. Yeah. No matter, I, I've been, I've been, uh, should I say, um, resuscitated twice from a flat line. Okay. Um, I have been on a ventilator. I don't want to get into all of that. The point which I'm trying to emphasize is the mind kind of wipes things away. Yeah. It's your coping mechanism. You're built like that. And you've got to keep refreshing uh, yourself because if you don't refresh yourself, uh, both with the history and with the future, your connect with the present will never happen. Mm -hmm. So to remain connected with the present, you need to understand where you're going and what happened in the past. And for me, I think these kind of episodes are very important for me to yeah. get that anchor. Anchor, because we tend to forget. There are times when we tend to forget. It's nature's own way of saying, you know what? Right. Time to be more grateful. Time mm. to be more intense in your relationship. Time to stop and just... Uh, I heard uh, this beautiful poem the other day from Rumi. I don't know the lines perfectly, but I want to really share with you. I mean, we talk about purpose and meaning and all of this. 
And right. Rumi, that uh, famous poet, he's saying, you know, this rosebud is so fragile and so beautiful. Every time I, I try to open it, I destroy it. But look how beautifully nature opens it. When I can't even open a rosebud, mm. what am I supposed to do about figuring out where my life is going to take me? Just enjoy yourself. Nature will take care of the rest. And enjoy doesn't mean just being uh, lazy about things and just being frivolous. Enjoy is even this conversation with you is an enjoyment, yeah. right? And I am getting the uh, the opportunity to relive and re even while I'm talking to you, re resharpen my thought process, right? It's yeah. forcing you into something more powerful and bigger, right. and that is. But you got to be intense about it. You got to be in the moment about it, yeah. and uh, find every opportunity to engage with life. So true. That's, that's so true. Uh, we are already ahead of people who are not on oxygen concentrators, man. Yeah. Uh, just think about it. There's so much we can do. We yeah. don't have to, uh, you know, keep saying. And that, that's true for our business too, right? Hundred uh, percent. Uh, nobody's going to come with a solution to you. You got to figure that solution to, for yourself. Yeah. You got to bring that value proposition on. Hundred mm, percent. In fact, I was uh, uh, hearing about this guy. Um, um, the the, uh, the guy who uh, invented Flickr and uh, what's the other uh, um, uh, other uh, the communication tool which a lot of business guys use uh, uh, Slack Slack yeah, the, yeah you know what's the story behind that no this guy uh, actually started off with a um, um, anime uh, gaming company. So these these things were embedded in part of the gaming company, and the gaming the game which he designed was a total flop. Right. But he took out pieces of this game and then sold it to different people. And the even though the game was a flop, the the, right. the IPR which he developed to make these chat rooms happen mm. turned into Slack and Flip, Flip, Flickr, which was sold for twenty five billion dollars each. Wow. So you start with something, yeah. right? Yeah. You start with something. Do you think his intensity was less? Did he even realize when he was doing this, he's going to make Flickr and Slack? No. He mm. was in the moment at that point of time to make that game. True that. True that. And then when that game was a disaster, he was in the in the moment to figure out which parts of this can he monetize. Yeah. yeah. And then he went and so that is the story of a life. I mean, we got to understand that. It's, you, you know, you've got to pick and choose depending on the circumstances and magnify, amplify, find value around it. I love that. Yeah. So uh, concluding uh, three questions now, uh, and uh, this one would be about, so a lot of people today are truly feeling uh, smashed and the feeling bashed, maybe not quite dashed just as yet, but you know, they're down and out. Um, and your advice to them, and I'm not only talking about just from the economy perspective, but in terms of health, you know, any other factors like bad relationships, et cetera, a lot of things are playing on people's mind right now. So your advice to them, you know, in terms of what they ought to be doing at this point in time. Number one thing you got to be doing is to stay healthy, right? Nothing, nothing will matter if you're not healthy. So it's yeah. number one thing is to stay healthy, yeah. right? Uh, the other thing is, you got to invest in your relationships. And when I say that again and again and again is, how, are you communicating with your existing customers? Telling them you are there, you are part of their yeah. story. You are going to back them as soon as the market changes. You, you are there to back them in their efforts. Right. They need to know you exist. They need to know you are still part of the plan and I can rely on you. Not that whatever you have, you'll sell to the highest bidder at that point of time, which also happens. And then... Yeah the long-term relationship bit goes away. So that's not relationship. It's you, you can act transactionally versus relationship. You know, there are two different uh, things here. So you've got to act in, in the interest of a long-term relation. Um, so that's two things. Number three, trust your gut. Uh, if you think you're, you're, you, you have provided a valuable service to your customer, uh, what, what else can you do al along with that? How can you magnify the value proposition to your customer even more? Um, right. You know, you've got to think about that. What yeah. else can you bring in? Uh, yeah. How can you attract new customers as soon as things open up? It's not going to happen at that point of time. No. You've got to build in those relationships now. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've got to also talk to your uh, vendors, telling them, you know what, even though your, your uh, uptake has become low at this point of time or non-existent, I need you. So be prepared. 
as soon as things become better i will be giving you my supply requirements so keep right. engaged with those people those yeah. relationships because without those raw materials you can't produce the intermediate or final product agreed so the whole chain you got to be in relation and now is the time to build new uh, uh, you know uh, should i say uh, uh, pathways Right. Brand new pathways, just like your brain when it gets affected builds new pathways. Yeah, you yeah. got to build new pathways, and the only way to build new pathways is to figure out um, uh, opportunities where you can present, figure out opportunities where you can meet other people who are positive. Mm. It, things are difficult, but yeah. you got to be realistic about things, but you can be positive about things. Uh, you know, there, there's a difference being realistic and pessimistic. Yeah. Uh, or realistic and positive i i i would tend to go with the realistic and positive right yeah so uh, these yeah, are these valuable um focus on the health uh, focus on the relationships keep your eyes and ears open for new opportunities and new paths and and when they come uh, take that step so yes very very valuable thank you so much and concluding question uh, so where do you see yourself in in 5 years from now and you know even from the perspective of bni gurgaon where where do you see yourself uh, in that journey 5 years from today I, I would see myself as a retired uh, guy uh, five years from now, where uh, the team would have taken over totally, and uh, I would have more opportunities. So, what I really love doing is just being in the middle of people and sharing my experiences, hearing their learnings, learning from that, and taking it to the next group yeah. and amplifying it for them. That's mm-hmm. what I really love doing. I would love to do spend more time doing that. Mm-hmm. So the whole uh, running the business piece and that goes to the whole team to do and i'm out of that that's where i see myself yeah awesome yeah, and i'm i'm sure you know uh, you'll continue to inspire continue to mentor you know all of us um rakesh thank you so very much uh, you've truly been one of the people who've always inspired me motivated me uh, one of only five people who i reached out to when i thought about following the path of the god of bhagat academy and asking you you know would you think i should do this with grand cardone and you were in a heartbeat you were like go for it and of course it has been a life changer so many thanks of course for always believing and uh, of course coming on the podcast today i wish you and the family well i hope your dad gets better soon too uh, the world truly needs more people like arthi and yourself and just want to say that we appreciate uh, you and all that you bring to us and give to us so thank you so very much thank you gaurav it's been an absolute delight pleasure to be exchanging views with you um it's just been a super super sunday afternoon thank you so much Thank you. Bye.